Kyle Bass, founder and CIO of Heyman Capital Management and founder of the private equity firm Conservation Equity Management. Great to see you again and welcome to the show. Great to be here, Julia. Good to see you. Yeah, well, I am so excited to talk to you just because I love the way you unpack uh, things that are happening in the world and you have a real knack for just making things really clear for folks. So to kick things off, let's start with your big picture of the overall economy globally and domestically. <laughs> just to kick things <laughs> off. Um, yeah, look, I, I, I think the, the overriding uh, kind of grill in the room, we, we know it's energy. But it's it's actually more than that, as we know, as as, as Europe is concerned uh, with with maybe uh, you know one of the worst winners of of power power prices that they've ever seen uh, due to their over reliance on on Russia uh, for their energy needs uh, and and first of all bad policy for the last call it twenty years uh, not having a, a proper transition plan from call it hydrocarbons to to alternatives. Um, and, and then on top of that, Putin's invasion of, of Ukraine has just accelerated the the problems in their economy. Uh, we, we in the US are, of course, experiencing some of that. But when you think about where we stand, we are uh, very close to being energy independent. We uh, grow almost all of our own food. We have two oceans protecting us. Uh, Europe, is kind of re a real mess. There's no central taxing authority. They've been following a, a, a green uh, a plan that's been uh, pushed by shareholders, NGOs, and, and some uh, well-placed teenagers alike. And in the end, um, it's been really bad policy that has gotten us to a point where, you know, Germany is going to spend eight and a half, nine percent of its GDP on energy this, this next year. And it normally spends one, one and a half percent. Just think about that, you know, in orders of magnitude, that is un, unprecedented. I know that word's probably overused, but it truly is. And um, Europe's going to see a pretty meaningful recession in the next 12 months. The question is kind of how meaningful. And then does, do, does Europe's power elite finally realize that price is teaching them that they have gone down the wrong path and it's such they've gone so far down the wrong path that they've got to turn around and really start heading down the right path, which I believe is, is nuclear in the longer run. And in the, in the, in the short to intermediate term, it's actually more hydrocarbons. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack in there. And um, I'm glad that you brought up energy because I think this is, like you said, this is one of the most important uh, stories playing out right now and unprecedented, as you mentioned. So um, it was a bunch of bad policy decisions and also, um, you know, kind of, you know, listening more to the NGOs or the teenagers. And I wonder if it's like they had good intentions here trying to move toward alternatives, but there's a real disconnect with the reality of the situation, which is that you do need more uh, fossil fuels. What do you like? Why do you think there was such a disconnect or is such a disconnect in you? Do you, do you think they'll finally realize that and get on the right path? You know, I, I look, I, as I mentioned, and you mentioned in the beginning, uh, I, I started a conservation based environmental private equity firm last year. So I, I've always been a, uh, a lover of the land and lover of the earth. And you can call me a tree hugger if you want. Uh, I'm, I, I wear that with pride. Uh, and so uh, we all want a successful transition uh, in, over the long run from fossil fuels to to more like nuclear, which I don't count as a fossil fuel uh, uh, because it's super clean and super safe, uh, and and alternatives like like uh, wind, uh, uh, you know, uh, water or, or hydro and and solar. Um, I think that that plan was just pushed uh, by those that are really you know wearing it on their sleeve, and we all love ESG, believe it or not. Uh, we think it's a great movement, but not having a transition plan. Uh, kind of hat in hand with the SG policy is is actually teaching global leaders that they've made major mistakes. Now there have been accelerants, i.e., Putin bought Germany back in 2005 when when uh, Gerhard Schroeder was voted out of his position in Germany. Within just a few days, he became CEO of Nord Stream One, uh, appointed by Putin himself, uh, and then he was appointed to be the chair of the board of Rosneft, uh, Russia's largest oil company, and then. 20 days before the invasion uh, of, of Ukraine, uh, he put Schroeder on the board of Gazprom. I mean, again, it's kind of hard to make up a timeline like that. And you see that Putin 
Ever since the wall fell in 1989, Julia, Putin's been planning uh, his 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 comeback, his retribution for communism essentially failing. Uh, and the reason it failed, if you really remember why, it's, it's, it's not written very often, but what happened was, you know, Gorbachev and Putin didn't wake up one day and decide back in 1989 that democracy was better than communism, that, that it was a better system to adopt, i.e., well, yeah, you guys are right and we're wrong, we should just change. What happened was we, along with the Saudis, intentionally pumped as much crude oil as we could and got the pricing down in those years to, to closer to 10, 12 bucks uh, a barrel, and we broke Russia, right? Russia has 60% of its GDP from the sale of Ural's crude. We used economic war to break communism, and, and it worked. And now Putin uh, is playing the long game by getting all of continental Europe to re re basically uh, um, um, rely on his gas supply uh, in Siberia. And now he, he actually has the dial for that marginal unit of energy for all of Europe and mostly um, Germany, uh, France, and Italy. And so Putin's playing a long game and you're saying what drove this? ESG policy drove it, but then there were, there were state actors that are not friendly to the United States fanning those flames at every moment. Putin's had a grand strategy, you can see it uh, with his actions in Germany, France and Italy, and the rest of continental Europe for that matter. Okay, so there's an energy crisis in Europe, and I would just want to kind of peel this back a bit more and talk about some of the broader implications, the ripple effects, how this might affect consumers, industries, and just, you know, continental Europe, um, generally speaking, what are you kind of looking for? What do you, what do you kind of make of this situation as it plays out? You know, I think about, you think about um, consumer consumption, um, Julia, I don't know, I don't know what... Share with me what your electric bill is today. Do you know? Do you know what your household electric bill is? Not that I, I don't know. It's included in my okay. rent. So I'm pretty okay. lucky in that respect. Okay, got it. Got it. So um, let's just assume that if you have a house, um, that your electric bill over the last five years has averaged around $400 a month. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm spitballing a number. But when you think about Europe, um, Europe's five-year average power price per kilowatt hours, right around 48 euros per kilowatt hour, uh, or sorry, megawatt hour. I'm using the wrong, wrong terminology. Uh, and now that number uh, got above a thousand for the winter. And it's somewhere between 700, 900 for calendar year 2023, uh, and still north of 500 for calendar year 2024. Just think about orders of magnitude. Uh, that's 10 and 20, 20 times your power bill. So if your power bill was 400 a month, imagine if it was 4,000 a month. And imagine that you just live on a, on a um, let's just say average income. Well, you can't pay that. No. You just simply can't pay it, right? So what happens to discretionary income uh, in Europe? Well, discretionary income is gone and it's digging into their, to their core uh, income and expenditures. And so many people will go without heat this winter in Europe. Many people, uh, that are kind of on the fringes of society, the poor uh, and the homeless will die um, because of bad policy. Um, and a lot of the sovereigns will end up, as you've seen, there's already subsidization programs in, in several countries. Well, that just means the sovereign is going to, the countries are going to have to pay for that, uh, um, for that, basically that, that um, subsidization of their energy. And why that's important is it could actually break the sovereigns. And so here we are in the Eurozone where they never recap their banks after the global financial crisis. Their banks are in a precarious position. Their population is in a precarious position. Um, Putin uh, and his invasion is, is basically sending immigrants uh, running from Ukraine uh, and, the, and the region into continental Europe. So, you know, he's weaponized migrants. He has titrated the gas delivery. He is doing fine, making plenty of money, and the Europeans are absolutely at death's doorstep this winter. But again, it's not just this winter. It's next year. It's the following year. This is a multi-year problem for Europe. Yeah, there's the numbers that you laid out there. That's, um, I mean, there's are stark. It's astonishing, especially when you just think about, you know, a typical consumer. Those are really um, incredibly high numbers. Okay, so how about for maybe a 
policy perspective? Is there anything they can do or should do? What would you recommend? I mean, in the short to medium term, what they, I mean, we've seen what Germany's doing. They're still decommissioning their last couple of nukes, but they're really firing up their coal plants. I mean, how does anyone think that's a good idea, right? So uh, they're going to realize uh, that gas, natural gas, when you burn natural gas, there are only, there are only two natural uh, um, byproducts, right? It's carbon dioxide and water is what you get when you burn natural gas. It's the cleanest burning fossil fuel out there. Uh, if you put together ways of capturing the direct stream of CO2 and sequestering it and, and uh, you know, uh, having water be the, uh, the, the other output, you know, I think people need to start drilling for a lot more hydrocarbons right now because it is, if nuclear is the answer, Julia, but that's seven to 10 years away if we start right now uh, in building these facilities. So we've got a problem where we need a short-term solution where there really isn't one but price and medium-term solution where the answer is more hydrocarbons. And I know no one wants to hear that, uh, but it's just a fact of life. The long-term answer is nuclear. Yeah. And it's important, like, it's kind of gets back to like critical thinking and also just like looking at these situations from first principles and that we do need more um, hydrocarbons, even though it might not be what you want to hear. It is um, the reality. Uh, maybe from like an investor perspective, um, would you want to be like long oil producers or what is there a way that you might want to express this? Yeah. For those that are highly sophisticated, you know, one of the greatest investments that I think has been made and will still be made over the next, you know, five years is if, if you buy uh, oil and gas royalty interests, you know, you're basically getting a piece of the gross revenue of the production. Um, and when you think about those, those trade anywhere from three to six times the current, uh, we'll call it last three years cash flow. Um, those are still pretty good. Those are low, low numbers as multiples. But what's important is the reason they trade those the, that low is the forward curve of natural gas and oil is so much lower than it is today. And there are structural reasons for, for why that is. Uh, and we, we don't have to get into those if you don't want to. But um, I think the forward curve is wrong. Uh, and I think that if, if and when we end up cutting rates again and expanding the Fed's balance sheet, we're all going to be fighting inflation once again. Uh, and the beauty of royalties is you catch all of the inflation, meaning uh, if it costs more for labor to bring guys into the field to drill, if it costs more for pipe, if it costs more for generators, if it costs more uh, for transport, all of those things end up in the price of the commodity. And if you own the royalty, you have a, you have a, a gross interest in that particular commodity. So you don't have to pay all of those costs. You get the benefit of all those costs. Again, that's for a more sophisticated uh, family office to buy those directly. There are a number of royalty uh, funds uh, in the marketplace. Some hedge, some don't hedge. You should look into those because those are listed vehicles in the stock market. Um, I think you should be unhedged personally, uh, given the macro view that I've just kind of laid out for you for the next seven to 10 years. Um, so, and then oil companies, oil companies or oil and gas companies are priced in the marketplace today the same way i.e. they're priced on the forward curve of a declining uh, revenue and income stream over the next three, four years. And I just think that's wrong. Can you elaborate a bit more on, on that? Yeah, I mean, again, when you're building a cash flow model, model that's a Ford model, um, you model in current production, you model in what they think they'll, they'll create through the drill bit and minus uh, what's depleted in the year. And they come up with a, with a number that's typically a growth number. And that growth number is multiplied by the price uh, of the commodity, whether it's oil or gas. And that price, the Ford prices of those things like gas today is somewhere around $9.20 uh, per MMBTU in the spot market. But just two years out, it's $4 on the curve. I think $4 is dead wrong. Gotcha. All right. Um, you mentioned the Fed. Let's bring up the Fed. And I would just love to kind of hear your views. Uh, what do you make of their recent uh, rate hikes and what's kind of your outlook um, as it relates to the Fed? Yeah, I, I just I think the Fed's focused in the wrong place. I think in inflationary recessions, which is where we are, um, the 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 la the most lagging indicator there is is payroll employment, and that seems to be what Powell's focused on. Um, 
raising rates into a marketplace where what you've just done is you took 40% more M2 and put it in the market over an 18 month period. Um, what you've got to do is suck that money out of the market and raising rates is kind of like pushing on a string in the beginning uh, because that's not really that, that, that mechanism takes a long time to, to play out. If what you start doing is QT and you're pulling hundred billion a month of risk capital out of the market, the market's going to feel that. Um, and we're just now getting started with QT on a net basis. We've done some QT in the last couple of months, but there's been uh, mortgage bonds uh, rolling off. Uh, and so that it, the net effect hasn't really been uh, a massive reduction of, of risk capital each month, but we're just starting to hit the stride where it is going to matter, um, Julia. And so I think, I think the Fed is, I mean, when was the last time you saw the Fed hiking at 75, 50 to 75 bips, bips a clip? when we've already had two uh, down quarters in, in real GDP. So, you know, um, we're kind of hiking hard and fast into a recession and Powell's speech at Jackson Hole mentioned the word pain a few times. Um, you know, he's telling you that soft landings out the window. Um, we're gonna have a hard landing and he's gonna cause some pain. Uh, and he says the pain is necessary to break the the mindset of inflation as, as much as it relates to uh, price and, and income. So how do you think that plays out? Do you think uh, we get to be more stagflationary? Like, what do you what do you think happens? Yeah, what I've noticed, Julie, I mean, as you know, it takes a while for them to actually tabulate, record and report these numbers. The numbers we're seeing uh, were numbers that were happening 90 to 180 days ago. Um, you look at the Mannheim used vehicle index down like 12 percent in just a handful of months. Um, you look at housing. Uh, the number of, of, of housing closures, i.e. sales, uh, that happened in the month of July was the second slowest ever, only to July of 2007. So you're seeing volumes literally collapse. You're seeing prices come off right away, 7.5% to 10% uh, in the last couple of months. Uh, used car prices are, are basically collapsing. Uh, at a rate that that hasn't been seen in a long time. Now they they were up a lot, right? So having them come down is not shocking to anyone. But the lagging economic indicators are still showing the the uh, slowing down of growth. But the forward indicators are telling me that the economy has basically come to a halt, uh, and we're going to see a pretty sig significant decline. So I think we're going to see a sharp recession in the U.S. Um, and depending upon how aggressive. Powell and the Fed is on the interest rate side, they can make it worse. Uh, I think they know they're going to make it worse based upon his last speech. Uh, but he's just trying to kind of kill this inflation boogeyman. What he's really got to do is pull money out of the system. He's got to pull money out of the system. Um, I remember when it was all the inflation was transitory. There was a lot of comments about transitory, recent, more recent comments about soft landing. That seems to be out the door. Like how, how can, I mean, from an investor perspective, like, how to seriously do you take what they say? Um, they... Think about just think about just the construct of how they report and this the concept of transitory. So let let me give you a hypothetical. Um, let's say you and I are running the Fed and COVID happens and we printed as much money as the Fed did, right? We we dropped in 40% more M2. And let's say that our reporting mechanisms weren't chain weighted and they weren't kind of make-believe, which is which is how they do it, right? They say. You know, the average car price today is uh, 47,000, but if you compare it to the average car 30 years ago, you have to you have to go like for like. So your power windows can't be power windows. They have to be rolled down. So you have to subtract the power window price. Your digital dashboard didn't exist. It was just analog back then. So you have to remove the price of your whole digital dashboard. And if you compare that car to the other car, it's really only up like 5%. It's not up 100%, which is how they calculate things. So if the, the money we put in the system we realized what it was doing is driving apartment rents and home prices up 18% a year for two years, which is about right. You know, you got to a 40% increase in money supply. You got to a 40% increase in kind of across the board in housing and rent. Um, when you start talking about inflation being transitory, the concept is they, they always report, um, you know, month over month and year over year, right? So if we got to move in the price level from 100 to 140 in a two-year period, we could at the Fed be saying it's transitory because the next print to get a print to go from 140 to 137 or 135 would be super easy. 
right? Yeah. So their concept of transitory is normally the inflation happens quickly and then they cool it off. And then the year over year, month over month prints start coming down a bit, but the price level moves from 100 to 140 to 135. And everyone says, oh, we're good again. <laughs> price level is still 35%, right? Yeah. So that's what's going to happen here. We'll have the price level come in a little bit and they'll say we created deflation and there have been seven deflationary or disinflationary periods since the Fed's founding, and all seven have been associated with recessions. That, that's just a case in point. That's, a, that's just an identity. It's true. Um, so we'll have one of those this time. We're already technically in one, despite the White House wanting to uh, redefine uh, recession. Uh, we're in one. Uh, and the question is, how long will we be in one? And then when will we be cutting rates? In the Ford curve look at the twos and tens, it's like 35 basis points roughly inverted. I think the Ford curve has it right. I think that uh, we're going to see uh, the Fed cutting rates a year from now or maybe a year and a half from now. Uh, I think the Fed will be aggressively cutting rates and trying to deal with the recession that that they created. Yeah. So they'll be cutting. In your view, they'll be cutting. Um, okay. So we are in a recession. That is two, two quarters of decline in GDP. It's, it, um, it's, textbook recession, despite what others think. Um, how do you, I mean, how do you think this one ultimately plays out or gosh, is it, or where do you think folks are going to feel it the most? Are we going to see more income inequality because of the Fed's policies? What do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think income inequality is just, is a natural consequence of a democracy, right? I mean, if you want to go socialism or communism, there's a real income inequality, but it's just a step function of the masses versus the, the elite. The, uh, you know, the richest people in the world are Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, and they run communist-based societies, right? So um, the income inequality here is more pronounced just because um, you know, every, most everyone is a private player and um, their net worths are reported on all the time. And so we all hear about the 0.1%, the 1%. The average American, and then the the the, the those in poverty. Um, so yeah, it, it, the natural consequence of Fed largesse is actually a widening Gini coefficient. Is is that income distribution widens, that net worth distribution widens, and it's just what happens. Um, and and I think that's likely to happen. The more difficult question, and and one I haven't really seen talked about, uh, is today. You know, these natural gas, these basically when you look at LNG cargos, they trade in, in, in dollars per MMBTU, just like the Henry Hub price in, in America does. Um, and, you know, you're seeing you're seeing Asia compete with uh, um, Europe uh, trying to secure these these LNG cargos and they're paying 40, 50, 55 dollars per MMBTU uh, and some as high as 70 uh, to secure cargos for certain periods of time. When in the U.S., our nat gas price is nine bucks. So you think about that differential. Um, our price just a year ago was, you know, four bucks. Uh, and the reason we've gone from four to nine is we're exporting every single MMBTU we can in LNG with our LNG export facilities that are open, trying to help Europe and to a lesser extent China and Asia, um, you know, ameliorate or, or at least titrate these these pricing problems. But Julia, what that's doing is causing pain and harm to America's population, right? Our middle class and our poor are suffering because we're willing to help Europe and Asia. So the tougher question is, as the acuity of the problem increases this winter, if you're running the United States, do you want to help and export even more and cause more pain to your population? Or do you want to say, you know, that's kind of their problem for pursuing a bad policy, we kind of have enough hydrocarbons here to help ourselves. What if we just internalize? And I, I realize that's not a globalist thing to say, but I think it's important to note that this is a real, real issue for the political elite, both on the Democrat and Republican side, as to whether or not they really want to help, continue to help Europe and Asia at the expense of the American uh, uh, population writ large, or, or do they figure out that they can they can kind of put in some green policy firewalls to future LNG exports and really um, internally internalize this without saying so, if you follow me. That's a very difficult question. Um, yeah. Where do you kind are. of lean on that? What's that? Where do you lean on that question? 
you know, um, I believe that we are, our democracy is at a fundamental, uh, fundamentally important inflection point vis-a-vis kind of communism and, and the, call it the axis of the, the communist bad guys, where you want to talk about China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, um, asserting themselves in, in various different ways. So I kind of think the West needs to get together. And look, we have a super abundance of natural gas. We are the Saudi Arabia of natural gas. We need to drill more, a lot more in the South and in the Northeast, in the Marcellus and we have basins that we could really, really drill out and put this gas in LNG cargoes and really help our allies around the world that, that, are, that are starved for these cargoes. Uh, so I come out on actually sacrificing America uh, a little bit more to help our neighbors, but do it with a all-in policy uh, to, to be helping these, these, um, these nations that are facing these, these real problems. Yeah. Do you think, um, I, I, I think that's a really important point. Um, do you think we are able to be able to drill? Can they turn it on? Do they have, are they able, willing to make those sorts of investments? What are you kind of seeing in that space or hearing from folks in that space? Well, it would take a major policy reversal, Julia. Um, you know, uh, the, this current administration, the first thing they did is they killed the Keystone pipeline, which would have piped heavy crude from our friend and neighbor, Canada, into our refineries to make refined products. I'm sure you saw Secretary of Energy's letters to Big Oil talking about the fact that we only have 50% of the average inventory level of refined products of diesel and jet fuel in our coffers in the Northeast that we normally have at this point in time. Um, and so we've got, again, we made some bad policy mistakes on killing the Keystone pipeline, which was super safe and getting heavy crude from our neighbor. And instead, what we've done is going to beg hat in hand for more crude from Iran. The, the deal we're trying to do for the JCPOA in Iran, if you knew the inputs of what we're willing to give up in concessions to the worst terrorists in the world that we have sanctioned right now, it would, it would actually really upset you. Um, and so we're going hat in hand to Iran. We're going hat in hand to Venezuela. We're going hat in hand to Saudi, uh, um, who, you know, are not really great friends of the US anymore. And we're asking them to pump more, um, which is just bad policy. So we should, we should green light Keystone. We should allow interstate pipelines to be built. You know, the administration says no more interstate uh, or uh, only, only, only intrastate pipelines are allowed to be built, not crossing lines. So we need to be able to cross lines. We need to be able to think more strategically about this. And then we should encourage we should encourage and give every reason for everyone to believe that we are willing to spend another 20 to 30 years with proper refineries and, uh, and proper pipelines to expand our energy infrastructure on the hydrocarbon side. Again, that would be a major policy reversal for the, for the team that's in there right now. Yeah. Um, gosh, just kind of begs the question, like, why haven't we or why? Is it, I just don't understand. Like, it just seems like common sense when you outline it. Yeah, I think you, you, you've seen in other areas of politics this this kind of breakdown of common sense in favor of an ideological pursuit. And, you know, I understand the, the ideology here. It actually makes sense. It, may, it makes sense to me. We all we would all love to be running on free renewable energy uh, for baseload power. The fact of the matter is it, the science and the math says we can't get there for a very long time, for decades. And we need to be planning there for, for the next few decades. Yeah, it's just so important. And I think it goes back to just critical thinking. And you mentioned um, we're at an inflection point and you brought up China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. I want to talk about China with you. I know this is an area you've been focused on. Um, talk to me about what your worries are today. What are you most concerned about? What are you most focused on as it relates to China? Good question. I, it, very simply, the the coming war with Taiwan. I'm I'm convinced that you're going to see Xi Jinping invade Taiwan. It's a question of when. I think U.S. military is there, DOD's there, U.S. intelligence is there. Um, and what does that mean to Western investments in China? What does that mean to Wall Street? 
who makes 12% of their revenue from China. What does that mean to pensions, foundations, and endowments that have billions of dollars invested in Chinese private equity and Chinese companies? Uh, I can tell you that the answer is it's not going to be good. Uh, and it, people's fiduciary responsibilities, um, they just turn a blind eye to their fiduciary responsibility to, to engage in, in their FOMO. Uh, but I, that's going to be a real problem, Julie. But geopolitically, they're going to invade Taiwan. What does that mean? How does the U.S. respond? How does Europe respond? How does NATO uh, respond, if anything? Um, and then our national security is really um, focused or, or um, uh, it's vital to our national security for us to have Taiwan semis, you know, call it high technology chip output uh, for many, many, many things in our military uh, world and, and in our civilian uh, corporate world. Um, and so that's a real, when I think about, when I think about what I worry about, it's how are we gonna deal with that gap between getting Taiwan semis wafer fabs built in the US. We've got two being built right now in Arizona and they're at varying stages of completion. We're still a few years away on the first one uh, and, a, and a few more years away on the second one. Um, those are 14, $15 billion buildings. Imagine one building costing $15 billion. I'd like to see it. I've never been in one. Wow. Um, but um, Samsung's about to break ground in Texas. Intel's about to break ground as well. Uh, we just have a duration mismatch, meaning if she moves in the next couple of years, we're going to have a real problem uh, with our national security and our our, avail our chip availability. Not only, not to mention that you know, Wuhan makes ninety five percent of the active pharmaceutical ingredients in all U.S. antibiotics. So somehow we let that frog boil uh, over time, and uh, now we rely we rely completely on China for our antibiotics and our blood pressure medicine. Well, that would be like us relying on Germany to manufacture our ammunition in 1936, right? That is that is crazy that we allow that to happen. So the balance of power is we can pull them off the SWIFT system and collapse their economy, meaning the US versus China, but they can withhold antibiotics, blood pressure medicine, and really cause us chip problems. So. It, this is one of those standoffs that it just just another Cold War, Julia. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, though, unlike the Cold War, I actually think there is a flashpoint that is destined to happen. What do you mean by like? Help me understand what you mean by that. Do you think this plays out as a Cold War, or does it get to be a hot? Where talk to me? I want to hear more about. And you mentioned a flashpoint. Um, let's look so, this so It's it's already a Cold War, clearly, right? I mean. Uh, you think about the four wars we can be fighting with China. Uh, number one is the hot war, the kinetic war, where the U.S. has the top war department in the world. Um, the second one is cyber war, which we fight with China every single day. We've been fighting that war since we allowed them to send a WTO in 2001, so for two decades. Arguably, we have the best cyber war department in the world. Um, the third one is uh, propaganda war, the information war. And uh, we don't have a war department for that. And China spends multiple billions a year on their bot farms, on all of their uh, dignitaries, whether they be uh, they're all official Chinese dignitaries at all, all the countries around the world and, and in the US, they're all members of Twitter uh, and participants in Twitter and they spew the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda line 24 seven. So they, they're, they're winning the propaganda war, although many of us are fighting back. And as you know, I take place in that war as, as often as possible, or take part in that war as often as possible. And then the, the fourth one uh, is economic war. And China's been an economic war with us since 2001. Um, it's not, it's obvious now, it wasn't obvious back then. Um, and we don't have an econ economic war department either. What we've got is we've got o Treasury and OFAC for sanctions. We've got the US trade rep, who kind of handles trade policy. We've got the Bureau of Industry and Security at um, Commerce. And then we've got um, um, the DOD uh, uh, slash US military and their dealings with the rest of the world. All of those different players field fly balls with economic war, call it missiles coming from uh, our adversaries, but we don't have a proper economic war department built in the US. And I think we need to build one. 
You think we need to build one? Yeah. Uh, let's talk about, you mentioned building out that kind of department. Is there anything that we could do to kind of avoid getting into a standoff here? Or is there smart policy? Or are we just too late? Were we just too short termism thinking about today at the expense of tomorrow here as it relates to China? Yeah, I, I just don't think it's, we're not the aggressor. What, what China is the master at is, is being the aggressor and then immediately figuring out how to put out propaganda that calls them the victim. You know, um, and a perfect example is Pelosi's visit. Somehow we are the aggressor, China's the victim, but China set up uh, an essential blockade for all of China's ports on their West Coast, or all of Taiwan's ports on their West Coast, uh, and ran active naval exercises and even shot missiles into the Sea of Japan. I mean, to call us the aggressor, given the disproportionate disproportionality of, of their response, is just laughable. Uh, and I think that this isn't up to us, uh, Julia. This is Xi Jinping gave a speech last year to the Politburo where he said his life's mission is the quote great re the rejuvenation of the great Chinese race unquote. That means the uh, merger of China and Taiwan. And he says his life will be incomplete or he'll be deemed to be an abject failure if he doesn't complete that mission. So, Julia, that is happening, right? He's about to receive. Uh, his emperor for life credentials. He has the tools for dictatorship, as he calls it, in his tool chest. He'll come out of this October meeting stronger than ever uh, and in need of fulfilling his dream. And every day that goes by, the U.S. gets closer and closer to being more self-sustainable on the chip side, on the on the antibiotic side, on the blood pressure side. So if you were a game theorist, you would say him moving sooner rather than later would be smarter for him. And so that's why I worry about it. Yeah. Um, at the top of this, you mentioned just the amount, I guess like the amount of business that's done over there. Um, I think Wall Street mentioned it's 12% of revenue. What do you think the business community should do or the investor community? You know, I mean, think back to World War II, um, you know, IBM and Watson uh, received Hitler's highest medal for helping uh, Hitler and the Nazis assimilate the Jews faster. I mean, literally had got, got the, 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 the Hitler medal. Um, you, had, you had many, many, many business interests in the US back then uh, that couldn't wait to further embrace Germany uh, and the German powers. And so today it's infinitely worse, meaning the business community is so deeply uh, invested in China uh, and the Chinese, and the Chinese are so deeply invested in our educational institutions, our financial institutions, our think tanks, um, and, and even, even lobbying our corporations and our government, uh, that this relationship today is much more intertwined than the relationship between Germany uh, and, and the United States back in 1936, right? Oh. How about, um, I want to just like bring up some other things with you as it relates to China, because a few years ago, um, you put out a piece about the ticking time bomb in their banking system. I just kind of want to bring up like their economic picture. Um, mm. People know that they can't trust the numbers that come out of China, but uh, what do you make of like their economic situation? And how might this also play into what yeah, we've been I mean, discussing? I've always said, you know, the construct of, of China's banking system. China's banking system is almost 400% of its GDP. The US is 100% of GDP, just to put things into perspective. They're almost four times more levered than we are uh, in, in system-wide. And 40% of the assets on their bank's balance sheet are loans to the real estate market. So their housing market is already down about 35% in volume terms, about 7.5% in price terms as of, as of last month. Um, and uh, that those are the numbers they're reporting, just to put things into perspective. Um, they're, they've been lowering rates, but the, the, the private credit demand um, has been dropping and not increasing. Their, their debt to uh, uh, disposable income ratios is at the household level is higher than the US's was at the, right before we entered the financial crisis. We were at the 113%, they're at 119%. So the private credit impulse 
that the government's trying to stimulate by lowering rates is not responding. And the, the Chinese Communist Party is, is really reeling, trying to figure out how to get credit restarted again. If they don't, and let's say they have a flat year with credit growth, um, their housing volumes will be down over 50% and price will be down over 15, which will be an absolute disaster for the banking system. So even though the rumors of Xi Jinping you know, losing favor because of his, his call it, they're talking about it, the failure of his economic stewardship of their economy. Um, you know, I, I think that's all BS. I think he'll come out of this, this Politburo meeting stronger than, than everyone else thinks he will. Um, but his economy is circling the drain. His banking system um, is hyper levered to real estate and hyper levered in general. Um, and so they're really facing a difficult period of time. And by the way, China's desperately short energy too. So China needs to buy energy, food, basic materials, base metals from the rest of the world world every day. Uh, and so China's in a real pickle right now. Uh, and we'll see, you know, maybe the distraction that they need is a war. If, if the economics get bad enough, uh, the thing that will create unity and stop protests, maybe uh, national pride. So you know, again, one of the things that that might negatively affect uh, Xi's decision as it relates to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess for like everyday Americans who are maybe watching or listening, what should, how, how should they think about this situation? Um, or what should they be paying attention to? What do you think? Yeah. Look, I, I, I said this recently. If you have a retirement account or if you have money invested in random, you know, Chinese equities that don't submit themselves to covered audits in the United States, you should probably sell those. Um, if, if the probability of war has gone from, you know, 1% to, I don't know what the, what the call it odds on number would be, but I bet it'd be as high as 20, 25% when I really think it's like 75%. But if those, if, if, if you have those odds, of receiving a zero for that investment, you should sell it. Um, and so I'm not giving individual investment advice. I'm just saying that in general, uh, what you wanna do is limit your risk to a genocidal regime that's likely to become militaristically belligerent. <laughs> because if it does, and I end up being correct on this, which I, I think I will be, um, your investments could go down 80, 90, 100% trying to think like what else we should bring up as it relates to China. I'm trying, I'm trying uh, let me give you some of the good news. The good news is the U.S. is in the best position of, of any country in the world, despite our political uh, failures. Um, I think that uh, we're going to have a sharp, short recession. I think that the Fed will be cutting rates uh, by the end of next year, early 2024. Um, and I think on the hard asset side and production side of, of uh, the economy, I think that you, you just carefully buy uh, this dip uh, and meaning over the next year or so, you just buy the things you like that are productive, hard assets. Uh, and I think you'll be better off two or three years from now. Um, you know, we are about to kind of enter the canyon. I know we've already seen a pretty strong response from, from the markets of the world this year as far as the, uh, the declines. But, you know, I don't think we're anywhere near out of the woods yet. And I think if the Fed's going to stay as aggressive as they are going into the midterms, the, the markets will be lower. Um, but again, don't fret if, if, you're, if your investments are mostly in, in U.S. companies. Yeah, U.S. is the place to be and um, perhaps look out for multinationals that do a lot of business in China, too, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. You want to avoid, look, you want to avoid the Disney's of the world. You want to avoid the NBA. You want to avoid anyone that does a lot of business with China. Uh, but the companies that are focused here, you know, headquartered here and, and focused on doing business with the West, that's where you want to be. Mm -hmm. So like, if this actually turns into um, like a hot war, um, if we see a flashpoint, what, what do you think happens like if companies do business in China in that scenario? Wait, say that again? What, what's like happening? If, if something happens in Taiwan with China, what do you think happens to companies that do business in China? You thought about that scenario at, at some point in time you know the american chamber of commerce lobbies the administration constantly to you know remove the tariffs to get a better relationship with china 
despite the fact that the last two secretaries of state say China is committing genocide. They have an autocratic ruler that's about to be dictator for life. Despite all of those facts, um, business, private sector continues to lobby anyone that'll listen to kind of re relax things with China. And, you know, if they invade, um, our sharpest, our, the, the, the sharpest uh, tool that we have in the toolbox is um, OFAC sanctions or, or, you know, against China's SOE banks and joint stock banks. It's, uh, it's blacklisting uh, any Chinese business does business with uh, uh, with the sovereign or is the sovereign, so SOEs. And as you know, almost every company there is already an SOE. So, you know, you say, what does that mean to corporate America? I, I just think that corporate America will have will be forced. Just just look, look what happened to Russia and how long it took McDonald's to pull out of Russia. And the fact that, you, you, believe it or not, Nestle hasn't even pulled out of Russia. Like if you drink Perrier or Pellegrino, um, just know that they're still in Russia. Um, and so I just I just think you can live life avoiding bad companies. Good point. Okay, so coming back here to the US um, in terms of investment opportunities, you mentioned um, you know, productive assets um, like real estate. I would love to hear you know, um, what's interesting to you these days. I know like you've been doing some stuff in real estate. Could you share with the folks um, what you, what's interesting to you from an investment perspective as it relates to those kinds of assets? Yeah, sure. I think I think the U.S. So the macro is we're going to have a we're going to have a recession, and at some point in time we're going to come out of that recession. The Fed will end up cutting rates, they'll end up expanding the balance sheet again, and fighting inflation is going to be uh, the 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 operating call it core thesis of of how I'm thinking about this. And uh, I couple that with the population dynamics of the U.S. I mean, before we got started, we talked about where you want to move to, where you are now how you move from New York to Florida, how you really want to get to North Carolina. Um, when you think about the population of the United States, the high tax, high cost jurisdictions like the Northeast and the West Coast, those people and corporate leaders are moving their businesses to pro-business, low tax or no tax, uh, low, low cost jurisdictions. And those are jurisdictions like Florida, like Tennessee, like North Carolina, like Texas, uh, where, they, they, again, you could run a business, you have uh, an urban sprawl where you can find really affordable housing, um, and, and you, can, you can bring huge businesses to those locations. So I believe the population dynamics are going to be secular, and they'll be this way for the next decade or so. And I think that the ramifications of those population movements are you're going to see uh, land prices in those destinations do nothing but move higher over the next decade. Um, and I think they'll outproduce or outperform uh, inflation. And then on top of that, you can actually do layered things onto those rural lands that generate additional income, whether you're running a hay program or whether you're running uh, a cattle grazing program or regenerative grazing, uh, whether you find a prolific amount of water on property and can do many things with that water and water is becoming, becoming a scarce resource. And We've bought enormous amounts of, of groundwater supplies in our in our new business uh, in the last nine months, and right now water's still unpriced in many of these transactions. So I think there are so many opportunities to engage in uh, land acquisition, conservation, mitigation of environmental damage that that just layer on additional income streams to your property that. Uh, uh, is I think it's the right equation for people as they go forward. You know, we we started a business uh, about a year ago. We've spent about ninety million dollars acquiring six properties where we are focused on uh, engaging in all kinds of environmental mitigation and and cattle grazing and hay programs and and boutique forestry and all of the things that one would do on a true environmental platform. And I think that. Our, uh, our goal is to generate superior non-correlated returns, but returns that outpace the, the inflation or the, the insidious diminution of value of your, of your savings. So it's where I'm going to spend the next 10 years of my life, Julia. And it's, it's been a lot of fun to date. I love that. Um, you know, I grew up in rural Virginia. And so like hearing you say that, like, um, you know, the conservation of the land and you really piqued my interest when you mentioned water. Um, can we talk about about that, like your views? Do you think that could be like an asset class or what do you kind of make of it um, as it relates to water? 
Yeah, I mean, as you know, in certain states, you, you, you're you not allowed to own the water. In certain states, you are. Uh, if you buy land, you typically own groundwater. Um, and given given the enormity of the drought that we've just seen, literally worldwide, but also uh, directly as it affects the U.S., um, that the dry line uh, continues to move further east. You know, e- e- the dry line used to be kind of... Uh, 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 in West Texas, and that that line continues to move east based upon you know the changing climate. Whether or not you believe in climate change, uh, one thing is indisputable: the climate has changed uh, in the last few years. And whether it's secular, secular or cyclical has yet to be seen. Uh, we don't even have to get into that argument. The bottom line is um, the climate's changing. Water's becoming a much more scarce resource, and um, you know we have focused on. Uh, properties that sit over aquifers with prolific amounts of water. And I just, I don't think a lot of people really thought that all the way through yet. Yeah. Well, if you do something cool with water, I, I'd like, I'd love to hear about it at some point. Um, sure. Yeah. Especially, we have great water where I'm from and originally from my, my parents' farm. Um, okay. So just for folks listening, um, if, if they're not aware of who you are, you called, um, the, basically the housing crisis. And you, that's where you kind of made your name was like 2007 during the housing crisis. Um, yeah. We've talked about a lot of ideas here, but um, I guess, do you see any sort of like a thing out there that's kind of like catching your interest that's, um, you know, maybe a bit more contrarian that other folks aren't necessarily paying attention to? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, contrarian, I think is it. I just think moving to, a hard asset asset class and spending a lot of time there for me uh, is is speaks more to kind of my core, my soul of, of loving the outdoors and, and wanting to be a proper land steward and steward for our country and our earth. Uh, but uh, also making, you know, let's just say superior returns or maybe even better returns than the stock market makes over that time frame having fun doing it and not being stuck to a screen every day. Uh, it sounds very appealing to me all the way through. My, uh, uh, you know, the contrarian in, in me, we still have uh, a big position in uh, being short the Hong Kong dollar versus the US dollar. If, if China moves on Taiwan, uh, I think that linkage uh, breaks. I think it breaks under its own weight uh, anyway. And I think if China moves, it'll just uh, increase, increase that possibility or probability. Imagine, if you lived in Hong Kong and you had free convertibility uh, between HKD and USD, you would actually be a fool not to convert to USD right now, right? I.e., why even take the risk of having HKD? Yeah. Well, um, Kyle, this has been a great conversation. Um, do you have any parting thoughts for the folks out there listening? No, I mean, uh, but if, you, if you're interested in this conservation angle, uh, and what we're doing in the private equity firm, um, you know, reach out to uh, Steele at Conservation Equity Management. I'm sure you can find it. Kyle Bass, CIO of Heyman Capital Management and founder of Conservation Equity, equity Management. Management. Yeah. I thank you so much for this enlightening conversation and your being so generous with your time. Hey, um, if you, you're very welcome. It's glad to be glad to be here, Julia.